Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we have five important papers in organic synthesis for the month of November 2022. The first paper for today is the oxidative heteroaromatization of nitrogen-containing heterocycles, using tempo as well as triddle as catalysts. Some highlights of this paper include the oxidative aromatization of nitrogen-containing heterocycles, as well as the catalytic use of tempo and triddle in the presence of an oxygen atmosphere. The proposed mechanism of this reaction is as follows. Initially, the triddle carbocation is reduced by tempo, producing a tempo oxonium species. This tempo oxonium species is able to oxidize the nitrogen-containing heterocycle to a radical cation. The triddle radical is able to react with oxygen, forming this dimer, and this dimer is able to split to monomeric peroxides. This peroxide radical is able to abstract a proton from the amine radical cation, producing this amenium. This amenium is able to tautomerize and lose a proton, giving the aromatized indole product. This triddle peroxide radical then forms triphenylmethanol, and through the treatment of acid, this regenerates the triddle carbocation, closing the catalytic loop. I want to just highlight that once tempo has done this conversion of the amine to the radical cation, the initial tempo has also been regenerated, closing the full catalytic cycle. So this paper overall has a really good scope. It doesn't just work on indoles, it works on a lot of different nitrogen-containing heterocycles. And since oxygen is the only oxidant, this is a really mild procedure. Here we can see that indoles, which are substituted as well as unsubstituted at the nitrogen, are both readily able to undergo this oxidation. It's functional group tolerant. There's many more examples than the ones I'm showing here. If you'd like to check those out, I'd encourage you to take a look at the manuscript. They also apply this to several other nitrogen-containing heterocycles, such as this quinoline, this quinazoline, as well as isoquinolines, although in the case of isoquinolines, only dihydroisoquinolines were formed from the tetrahydroisoquinoline starting materials. Additionally, they were able to fully oxidize these piperidine-containing compounds, as well as this piperazine analog, as well as this harmine analog. The second paper for today is the 1,4-oxyimmination of two electronically distinct olefins. I was honestly a really big fan of this paper, and this incorporated the photochemical multi-component reaction of this carbonyl-containing oxime derivative, and through this addition reaction, an electron-rich and electron-poor olefin were both able to participate in this multi-component reaction in the presence of a photocatalyst, giving this masked amino acid type product. This would be an amino acid if the electron withdrawing group was a carboxylic acid or an ester or something similar. So the proposed mechanism of this paper is as follows. Initially, the photocatalyst is able to do an energy transfer, splitting this oxime into a nitrogen radical as well as an oxygen radical. This nitrogen radical is persistent while this oxygen radical is highly electrophilic. And as this is electrophilic, it probably won't surprise you, this is going to react with the more nucleophilic alkene, A1. Once this reacts with the less substituted position of A1, the radical generated in this position is a more nucleophilic radical, and nucleophilic radicals can add into Michael acceptors, just as you would expect a typical nucleophile would add into a Michael acceptor. So this adds into the double bond. This then creates a radical alpha to the carbonyl. This alpha radical is then able to be terminated with the persistent imine radical, giving product 4. If they did this in the absence of A2 and they only used A1, this was able to still react with both the oxygen-containing and nitrogen-containing radicals, giving product 2, although they never observed the formation of product 3, where both of these radicals would react with the Michael acceptor. The scope of this reaction was quite good. You might think a lot of the time in the literature you see a million examples with styrenes or really, really activated positions, but I was quite pleased to see the scope of this paper being really decent. So the photocatalyst that they used in this work was thioxanthone. They used blue LEDs as their light source. And a number of different unactivated olefins were explored, such as this exocyclic cyclobutene analog, this vinyl ether, these vinyl silanes, this alkyne-containing silane, as well as more complex examples. You can see that because this is a 1,4 type addition process, the nitrogen of the imine is going to be alpha to this ester, although the oxygen-containing portion ends up being delta to the carbonyl. In addition to screening different unactivated olefins, they also screen different Michael acceptors. Here you can see they're really just showing off with compound 46. They have a vinyl ester. That's not a problem. The vinyl group stays there. No issues whatsoever. Here you can see a vinyl phosphonate was used. Here we have this B mita complex. This is an emerging motif. If you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to look more into the chemistry of mita, as well as more complex ones, such as this heterostyrene and this alpha beta unsaturated ketone. I also want to point out that while all of the examples here are shown using 1A, they also explore a few other analogs in the manuscript, and I'd encourage you to check that out. 
Once these products have been isolated, they're able to be treated with hydrochloric acid to unmask the imine as this amine, as well as this carbonate as the corresponding alcohol. So you can make amino acid derivatives as they show in these six examples. I thought this was really cool and I'm excited to see what people end up accomplishing with it. The next paper is the nickel mediated SH2 reaction. This is a really important paper. I wanna highlight that this is a really significant paper that you should definitely pay attention to. There's one other really important paper in this episode, and I look forward to sharing it with you. The highlights of this paper include the conversion of carboxylic acids into new carbon-carbon bonds via SH2 with nickel-2 as the catalyst. SH2 is like SN2, but it's radical type substitution, where one of the radicals is stabilized to a metal center. In this case, it's nickel. This also involves metallophotoredox with iodine-3 reagents as activators. In this protocol, the way this works is the primary radical or the less substituted radical is able to coordinate to the nickel, and then the more substituted radical is able to do an SH2 reaction at that metal center. So here you can see what that looks like. This is the primary radical has bound to the nickel three, it's nickel three after oxidative addition, and the other radical is able to attack at that carbon center, reducing the nickel back to nickel two and releasing the new sp3, sp3 product. This is extremely useful as it can forge new quaternary centers, and it's a really exciting piece of work. So the proposed mechanism of this reaction overall in more detail is initially the radical has to be generated. In the case of the carboxylic acid of the substrate you're interested in, this is able to coordinate and displace one of the ligands on the iodine three. In the case of this one, it's just got like a CH2 with an R group. Maybe that R group is another proton if you're trying to add a CH3. This is able to interact with the excited photocatalyst, which is then able to decarboxylate both carboxyl groups and undergo reductive elimination. This also reduces the iodine three reagent to an iodobenzene, and these two radicals are generated. Now, only one of these radicals is able to selectively bind to the nickel. Once this happens, the SH2 process occurs where the more substituted radical is able to attack at that carbon center, reducing the nickel and affording the cross-coupled product. In this case, they were able to use this thioxanthone, similar to another paper mentioned today, or alternatively, they could use 4CZIPN, which is another metal-free photocatalyst. The scope of this paper was really good. I'd encourage you to check out the whole paper if you wanna see the totality of their scope. In these examples, you can see that the acetate groups on the iodine three reagent end up just providing a methyl group because they're acetates, the CH3 group is the part that transfers. And so starting with a carboxylic acid, this is decarboxylated, the radicals generated, and they end up forming a CCH3 bond. So here's an example on a primary center, here's an example on a secondary center, here's an example on a tertiary center, and finally, here's an example which was an alpha amino acid. They also do some late stage examples on really interesting complex compounds, such as this hydroxyproline derivative shown here, where this tolerates all of the other functional groups, it's not an issue. In this next one, we have this gibberellin A3. This is once again able to be selectively functionalized at that position with decent DR. When UV light was used instead of blue light, they got differing selectivity. I didn't mention this on the previous slide, but the reason that they have those two different dots is under different photochemical conditions, they observe different product ratios. And the last example I wanted to mention was this tetrazole shown here, where this was able to form the desired methylated product very easily. In addition to methylation, they demonstrate that other carboxylic acids in the iodine three reagent could be used. So instead of just acetates, they could have different carboxyl groups. Here you can see a tridutero-methyl group was added. Here a carbon-13 methyl group was added. And then they also show other examples such as this methyl ether, this chloride, and there's many other really cool examples. And overall, I think that this is a really useful tool. Normally you might think about how could I reduce this to an alcohol and then convert that alcohol to a CH or Maybe if you wanted to add some other longer group there, you could think of adding a Grignard into a carbonyl and then reducing it down somehow, but this is just a much nicer approach. This is bringing us towards organic chemistry as Lego pieces, and I think that's pretty awesome. This chemistry is quite impressive, but it's not quite as impressive as my transition to our sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Reaxis. Reaxis is my preferred chemistry information system for searching chemical reactions and related literature. They also have a free app for iOS and Android called Reaction Flash. Reaction Flash is an app with over 1,000 named reactions in organic chemistry, and you can quiz yourself on how these reactions work, what reactants are used, and what sorts of products are formed. 
I have specifically used Reaction Flash as a way to learn more reactions that may help me come up with new ideas for my research. The app allows you to view the mechanism of named reactions, test your knowledge with an interactive quiz, and search through numerous specific examples of these reactions from peer-reviewed literature. Thousands of students and researchers already use Reaction Flash. Reaction Flash is a great app as an up-to-date reference and learning tool for chemical reactions, so why not download it today and give it a try? You can download it on iOS or Android by clicking the link in the description. That way they'll know you came from here. I'd like to thank Reaxis for their support of this channel. The fourth paper for today is another really important paper, and this is the meta-functionalization of pyridines, and I really love the approach that the authors took in this paper. So they take this dimethyl acetylene dicarboxylate. This is able to do a multi-component reaction with methyl pyruvate, producing this de-aromatized pyridine product. You can imagine that the pyridine nitrogen is nucleophilic. It's going to add into this Michael acceptor, but then you have that extra electron density in the alpha position that is able to do an aldol reaction. And this alkoxide that's formed is able to attack the amenium of the pyridine, forming this bench-stable intermediate. This intermediate can then be functionalized using radical chemistry or other electrophilic chemistry, affording functionalized products. And after this functionalization has occurred, treatment with acid reforms the pyridine. So they're able to do perfluoroalkylation, halogenation, nitration, and many other forms of electrophilic addition. So once they form these intermediates, if they wanted to add a perfluoroalkyl group, they do this photochemically in the presence of DBU with blue light. And if they wanted to do electrophilic functionalization they don't need to do photochemical conditions. This just happens under normal chemical conditions. Finally, to unmask this group, they just treat it with acid. So in terms of perfluoroalkylation, some of the highlights include this perfluorobutylation, perfluoroethylation, and some trifluoromethylation. You can see that this isn't limited to just pyridine. You can also have extended pyridine analogs. Here's an example of a quinoline. Now in terms of other functionalization, here's an example of this cotinine where they were able to convert this to several different analogs. Not only did this work with pyridine, but they also found that this worked with this thiazole as well as these other interesting pyridine containing compounds. I quite like 38 where you can see the monochlorination of this pyridine in the presence of these other pyridines. So overall, I'm quite impressed with this chemistry. You can see the meta selectivity is really good. Although there are some examples where if you had two substitution, for instance, when they had two phenylpyridine, I don't show this here, but you can see this in the full manuscript. When they had two phenylpyridine, they would observe a mixture of three substituted as well as five substituted products. So occasionally they do lose a little bit of selectivity. And occasionally if they have multiple pyridines, they will see some dye functionalization, but it's relatively limited and it's usually specific to the electrophile that they choose. They also show some late stage examples. Here you can see that milrinone is able to be trifluoromethylated, although they do see a little bit of bis trifluoromethylation. Additionally, there are some other examples here like loratadine. I was quite impressed to see this late stage functionalization of loratadine. You can see that this carbamate group's not even touched. And in the presence of a more complex example like this imatinib precursor, you might expect electrophilic functionalization to take place on the left hand ring, but they still are able to selectively functionalize this pyridine. Really impressive. Quite pleased to see this work. And I look forward to seeing this chemistry mentioned in the next edition of Phil Barron's book. The fifth paper for today is the cyclopropylamination of aryl halides using redox active esters. This can generate a radical, which can then undergo cross-coupling with nickel to afford these cyclopropylamine type products. These are useful as possible isosters, and some highlights of the scope include this phenylalanine derivative, this aliphatic chloride, this TMS substituted alkyne, as well as some other examples where instead of the typical cyclopropane, they have this difluorocyclopropane and this vinyl cyclopropane. And additionally, they explore more complex examples such as this Weinreb amide, this pyridine containing compound, this triazole, this pyridinone, and this also tolerated ortho substitution. In addition to the cyclopropylamines, they were able to show that oxetanes as well as cyclobutanes were tolerated. And finally, they have this one example where we have a bicyclo group where the amine is part of the ring. So overall, a really impressive procedure. And if this is interesting to you, I'd encourage you to check out the remainder of the paper. Now for this month's honorable mentions, I'm gonna toot my own horn a little bit here. I didn't think it was right for me to talk about my own papers in my series, but I was an author on two papers published in the past month, one in Chemistry a European Journal, one in Orglet, and I'll include links to those in the description if you'd like to check them out. In terms of other honorable mentions for this month, we have the halogenation of pyridines in the three position. This is another good paper. They unzip the pyridines, functionalize, and then reclose using triflic anhydride. 
Another interesting one was this functionalization of cyclopropane containing pyridines, the conversion of aliphatic fluorides to iodides, and then cross-coupling using cuprates, cross-coupling of 5-bromo-1,2,3 triazine. This is another cool one if you're interested in triazines. There was this interesting paper involving an aryl shift and ring opening of benzoyl formates. There was a couple decatung state papers. If you like decatung state photochemistry, these papers are definitely worth a read. There was the cycloadditions of sulfoxonium illids as building blocks. These were kind of cool. And there's the synthesis of BCP-like bicyclo 311 heptanes. So hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. I do one of these every month. So if you missed out on last month's papers, there's even more important papers for you to check out. I'll include a link to the playlist in the description. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.